Well, as far as well, at least as far as the stock market goes, I think the the same manipulations have uh, continued, but they will be ending soon. Uh, we've seen changes uh, in policy by the Federal Reserve that have not taken place in many years. Uh, one of those changes that just recently took place is that the Fed will now be reducing their balance sheet. Uh, if you look at a graph of the Federal Reserve balance sheet along with a graph of the stock market over the past few years, you'll see that almost every tick upwards uh, it matches with the Federal Reserve balance sheet. So if the Fed is ending uh, that, you know, they're, the increase in their balance sheet, they're reducing it now, uh, what do you think is going to happen with stocks? I would say that the correlation will probably continue and that stocks will start to decrease. We've actually seen stocks um, start to move more aggressively uh, both directions, up and down, which is something we haven't seen in quite some time recently. And I think that's because I think that's happening in correlation with the Fed's newest policy of reducing balance sheet. So with stock markets, um, the manipulation has continued. Uh, I think that is ending soon, though, as the Fed reduces its balance sheet. Uh, along with that, we have some geopolitical events that I think will provide some distraction so that the Fed doesn't get any blame for that. Um, but, you know, they've given Trump enough time to get out there and, and claim uh, <laughs> almost basically claim credit for the, the stock market increase over the past year. So I would say it's about time for them to start taking it down. So when this does happen, and of course, Trump has been out there saying, you know, the stock market's going up uh, because of me, what is going to happen at this point? Because if it starts coming down, you know, people are going to be looking at this going, OK, what just changed? Why is this happening when everything was going perfectly well? Now, now what does he do? I think you'll have a massive blame game. I think you'll have, uh, you know, leftists on one side, uh, Federal Reserve on their 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 own side as usual, uh, probably blaming Trump. Uh, you'll have Trump blaming, uh, you know, possibly the Democrats for uh, interfering with his his policy changes and legislation. Um, I think you'll have uh, Trump blaming a lot of other factors. And I think we'll also have uh, a geo geopolitical event of some kind. Uh, it's looking like so far uh, either North Korea or uh, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Iran, that situation over there will be the geopolitical distraction that covers for the economic downturn. Okay, we're, we're going to get the, to that in a little bit, but I wanted to just continue on with the economy. And underneath the economy, you know, everything that the corporate media and everything that they don't talk about, I mean, are you seeing the economy, is, is it doing well? Is it not doing well? I mean, from what you're seeing and what you've been reporting on, how is the actual economy doing right now? And I'm talking about the people's economy, where they feel it and see it every single day. Well, I, I mean... Oh, I guess all you have to do is take a look at the what they're calling the retail apocalypse of 2017 going into 2018. Uh, we've seen um, far more uh, retail closures um, so far, I mean, to this point this year than back in 2008, 2009 um, after the credit crisis. So uh, that's certainly a pretty big signal that something is very wrong. Now, the mainstream media will claim that this this is entirely due to a shift by the public over from uh, brick-and-mortar retail into online retail. That's completely false. Online retail only accounts for... A, approximately 11 percent that's that's uh that's a high estimate approximately 11 percent of all retail in the united states so uh, online retail 11 percent is not going to be enough to offset and put at out of business, you know, thousands of retail store, brick and mortar retail stores. It's just not enough. Um, that that cannot be used in, as an excuse by the mainstream for why this retail apocalypse is happening. So, 
I, th- I think that uh, retail closings, the massive amount of retail clo- closings are a huge signal. We, we see this happening in the economy. And at the same time, this is all happening. We see that uh, there are countries moving away from the petrodollar. I mean, Venezuela said, oh, we're going to be going to the petro yuan. We see other countries like maybe Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iran. They're all shifting away from the petrodollar. You wrote a couple articles about the petrodollar. And I wanted to get your take on why are countries moving away from the petrodollar and will this have any type of impact here in the United States? Well, I think there are a number of reasons uh, why they are moving away. I think one uh, big reason, which I don't think a lot of people consider, is that the the U.S. is now a major exporter of oil. Uh, So we have become a competitor to OPEC and uh, other oil producing nations and we also have our currency tied directly to to oil trade around the world uh so this is going to you know a lot of these in the past the US was not a competitor to the oil producing nations now we are why should OPEC and other uh oil nations allow us to continue having uh, the petro currency the the premier global petro currency and have that advantage while we are also an oil exporting competitor it doesn't make sense for them uh so i i expect that's one reason just pure com- com- competition they're going to move away from the petrodollar because otherwise that gives us a massive advantage over them um Another reason would be, you know, in my view, and I've outlined this in numerous articles, is that it's uh, advantageous to the globalists to begin diminishing the U.S. dollar in order to then uh, make way and institute their SDR basket system and eventually a uh, what looks like it's, it will be a, a cashless uh, or a digital currency system. So in the fastest way to diminish the U.S. dollar would be to remove petro status, would be to influence other governments and, and uh, uh, OPEC nations and basically uh, you know, major import-export nations to drop the dollar as a reserve currency. Uh, dropping petro status or killing petro status would be the fastest way to accomplish that. When this happens, where do those dollars go? I mean, the countries are holding dollars to purchase oil. And if they start moving away from the petrodollar system, do they really need to hold on to these dollars? Where where do they go? Well, the smart people will get rid of their dollars rather quickly, and those will all flow back into the United States. And there's really, because we have no oversight on the Federal Reserve uh, we have no we, we have no way to audit how many dollars they've created and exported overseas. Um, there's really no way to tell how much uh, how how much of the currency will be flooding back into the U.S. and what kind of inflation that will cause once it's uh, flooding back into the U.S. But it will come back here eventually, most of it, except for the people who are. Uh, the last one's holding the bag, and they might not be able to get rid of their dollars at that point. So so you see inflation definitely hitting the United States here at one point? Yes. Once uh, petro status is lost or eventually reserve currency status is lost, uh, then we would see massive inflation in the United States. Okay. Now, at the same time, there are countries moving away from the petrodollar and some are taking on the petro yuan. We see out in Saudi Arabia, which is like the hub of the petrodollar, where they had some type of coup within their country where a lot of the princes and uh, different monarchs within the country, their bank accounts were frozen. Some of them were arrested. From your viewpoint, what why, or I should say, why is this happening in Saudi Arabia right at this point? Well, I think there's a massive uh, political and economic shift planned for Saudi Arabia. And part of this plan was put together by, well, it's uh, ostensibly it was put together by Prince uh, Mohammed Sulman, 
who is basically the most powerful uh, member of the royal family and the one rising to uh, a the, the point of I, I, at this point he's almost a dictator um, he's in control of all the most important uh, centers of power within Saudi Arabia and the king is aging and will likely either abdicate or step down in the near term probably take on just a, a, a figurehead role but but nothing in terms of being in control of actual power structures so uh prince mohammed will be it he will be the uh dictator of saudi arabia at that point and part of his uh, plan for the next decade is uh, something called the vision for 2030 and within the vision for 2030 is an outline to uh, decouple the Saudi currency from the dollar and also make uh, the make Saudi oil less uh, reliant on US business basically they will break from the petrodollar at which point when, you, when the Saudis break from the petrodollar then a lot of other oil producing nations will follow suit they'll do the same thing so there's a massive shift in Saudi Arabia towards this plan and if you look at the people who back uh, Prince Muhammad he is backed by all the same globalists the whole cast of characters that we 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 know and and greatly dislike or hate um the carlisle group blackrock uh goldman sachs the, <laughs> there's numerous uh countries are not countries uh corporations backing solman and his uh, public investment fund or the PIF. So this is all uh, Solman is tied to the globalists. The Solman's actions directly affect the petrodollar. This once again sort of reinforces my argument that the globalists are seeking to diminish the US dollar and replace it with something else. So they pretty much know that the dollar is pretty much done for because of so much debt around the world, so much global debt. And uh, from my point of view, it looks like they're saying, okay, we need to switch over at this time and we need to switch now. Uh, is, is that what you're saying? Yes. To Yeah. I would say either this was completely uh, deliberately done and planned from the very beginning or that it was uh, you know perhaps they drove the dollar into the ground over time and simply what they do when they destroy one, the an old world system they replace it with a new world system so they can get control uh, at that nexus point right off the bat before somebody else comes in with a, a better idea or, or an idea that doesn't involve them. Uh, my view is that they actually have deliberately uh, diminished the dollar over time, that this has been part of the plan all along, and that uh, this, this uh, shift in Saudi Arabia has been part of the plan for quite some time. The death of the petrodollar has been part of plan for quite some time and that instituting the SDR uh, has always been well at least has been part of the plan since at least uh, the 1980s because as we saw in in uh, the economist in 1988 they openly admit that uh, the dollar or the U US influence in the in the world will have to be diminished and that the SDR basket system will be a bridge to a world currency so I, I really do believe that this has been the plan all along. I don't think that they're just jumping on this at the last minute and trying to arrest con rest control uh, of the situation. So you said before that they're pretty much all the same players that we had before. So we're not really going to a better system or going outside of the central bank or outside of these bankers. Basically, what they're doing is they're just moving us into another system that they want us to move into. And they're sta they're keeping control. Yes. And the reason for this is that some people would say, well, they already have control through the, the U.S. dollar as the world reserve. Uh, why would they need to create a new system? Well, well, they have they have control. You have to understand the psychopath. The, the control they have is never enough. They always want more. So uh, this is about total control of 
of every minute detail of the global economy. Uh, in order to do that, in order to institute that, they're going to have to uh, centralize everything into one core institution. I believe that will probably be the IMF or the Bank for National Settlements. Um, it, at that point, then, once you have a single uh, gl global economic authority and a single monetary system, then the next step to global governance is, you know, not very far away. And I believe that is that is the ultimate goal: is a global economic authority, a single monetary system, and uh, global governance. So I'm going to throw in cryptocurrencies into this whole thing. Now, they're trying to, you know, reset us into a, a completely different system. And then we have the, the crypto market where there's a lot of people getting involved. Even uh, Christine Lagarde from the IMF came out and said, you know, Bitcoin, you know, that could be used for transactions. We know that UBS and other banks and central banks, they're trying to create their own coin. Are, are, are they threatened by the crypto market or do they want the crypto market or don't they want the crypto market? From all indications, it seems that they they love the crypto market. They love the blockchain system. And I, I've even read uh, Goldman Sachs's outlines on, on uh, block, blockchain technology and they basically they they lavish it with praise they they seem to love blockchain technology uh i think that is because they they and they want ultimately they want a cashless a digital society they want a completely digital monetary system and a cashless society because through that there is no you, you remove all privacy within transaction um, because uh, you know I mean there there are some people that will argue that there are ways to maintain anonymity within the blockchain I'm reticent and suspicious of that I, I think that well, it, at the very least, when the uh, elitists institute their digital system, it will certainly there certainly will be no anonymity. Uh, so <laughs> um, that's what they want. They they want a, a new blockchain system uh, for the world and for a, a single monetary uh, uh, system for the world. And remove all privacy and transparency through that system, so that they can track everything that we do through our through our purchasing. Um, once cash goes, as much as we hate fiat money, uh, it's still private. So once cash goes, we lose all uh, economic privacy. And I, I think that the move towards a uh, blockchain technology and the amount of praise that the elite the elites are giving blockchain technology shows that they uh, see that as a tool for their future system now they would have to control the blockchain I mean if if we were using a cryptocurrency a coin outside of their control where it was being issued outside of their control that wouldn't benefit them they they need to convince every government to use their system, their their coin, their cryptocurrency. Possibly, there's some indications that there is all they already have a plan through the SDR to create a uh, basically a, that ties in a lot of different currencies into one system. Um, there's also uh, the issue of competition. So when you have a currency, say. Uh, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, uh, these are these are essentially products that someone else could create. Someone else could create something exactly like Bitcoin, um, and it really wouldn't actually be that difficult for central banks to do that. Um, then, then you have an issue of competition. You have multiple uh, cryptocurrencies competing against each other, but the central banks and governments have the added uh, massive amounts of capital and massive amounts of force to back their cryptocurrency. So then it becomes a matter of will the public wh – which cryptocurrency will the public choose to use or will they even have a choice? Um, 
I think that the central banks believe that they can push their version of the of blockchain tech and crypto onto the public and diminish any other competing cryptocurrencies. I wanted to move on to the deep state and I wanted to get your take. I mean, the cabal, the deep state, the establishment, where do they stand right now? Have they lost power? Are they gaining power? Uh, are they still controlling everything that goes on with the intelligence community? Or uh, I mean, what do you what do you see happening right now with the establishment, the deep state? Well, I think they I think they are on a timeline and 28 the year of 2018 seems to pop up consistently within uh their timeline and uh, so you, it does appear that there seems to be some franticness in their their actions and activity and uh, it's hard to say if that's uh, a reflection of a of a lack of um, uh, you know organization, or maybe some of their plans have not worked out, or if it's just a reflection of all the chaos that that's automatically comes with any major uh, global, uh, like a global economic reset or a global geopolitical reset. Um, it's hard to say. There's there's so much uh, f uh, smoke and mirrors surrounding this reset that you know some of it might look like uh, discombobulation with the elites when it isn't. Uh, it isn't at all. It's um, perfectly normal for them. So uh, I think so far uh, they seem to be moving forward with their plan. 2018 seems to be a major. Uh, uh, time marker for that plan. Um, I I would hope that the public will start to take action uh, on their own to stop these events from which people like you and me uh, stepping forward and putting an end to this in order for their plans to uh, uh, be obstructed. So we've been talking about the reset. Is this going to be a smooth reset or do you think this, the whole system is going to come down? Um, we're going to see riots and, you know, people struggling for a little while while they bring the others, you know, system online. How do you, how is this going to play out? Well, when I look back at most what I would consider major resets, uh, social resets, economic resets, political resets, there's definitely a lot of uh, turmoil and uh, tragedy surrounding those events. So I would not expect that this time would be uh, any different, especially considering this may be the, the largest reset ever attempted uh, by the establishment. So I would expect a certain amount of crisis and and calamity uh, when this occurs, or as it as it's occurring, it's really occurring right now. We're just in moving in through different phases of this shift. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say people should prepare for a major crisis, and uh, you know. Pr prepare for the worst obviously hope for the best prepare for the worst now when you say this is the the largest reset that they have ever done uh w w just explain to everyone what what does that mean well i this is uh, a shift into what i believe will be a completely central a globally centralized system so you're going to have massive changes uh, that we've never seen before, and uh, you know, uh, including the change from you know ca cash-based systems into more than likely a digital-based economy. So the amount of uh, turmoil that that will cause. Just look at look at uh, the example of India when they started pushing a cashless system in India and how much turmoil that caused in that one country. Now, imagine that on a global scale. Um, it's going to be uh, uh, pretty, uh, you know, the distraction will be massive and the amount of catastrophe that could occur will be massive. I think the uh, globalists seek to uh, you know, in some cases, create this deliberately, and then weather the storm, and then come out once uh, the ashes have settled and offer their solution to the problem. 
uh, which is usually more centralization. Now, in the beginning, uh, we talked about the, an event, a distraction to this uh, economy, which is failing. And we see problems out in Iran. We see problems with Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, North Korea. Uh, do you believe that they are trying to push war in these areas? It's possible that they're that they are trying to stage trigger points around the world, and they only are seeking to use one of those as a distraction. I sometimes think they they use what I kind of call a scattershot effect, which they they attempt multiple. Uh, trigger points around the world, and then some of them may work to their advantage. Uh, some of them may not work out so great. They they do the scattershot effect and hope that most of those events will uh, work out the, their way. Um, but I would say that certainly North Korea and Iran both seem to be on the table. Uh, North Korea. Uh, the the U.S. is stationed for the first time in a decade three uh, carrier groups right near North Korea. Uh, Trump is discussing naming North Korea as a uh, supporter of terrorism uh, officially. So, you know, North Korea is still clearly on the table. Trump also just finished his tour in Asia. So, uh, you know, there's a likelihood that, that part of that tour was to... Uh, rally Asian nations around regime change in North Korea. Saudi Arabia and the amount of uh, uh, war rhetoric and war drums involved with Iran and the uh, and Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, is increasing drastically. And I think once uh, Prince Mohammed has solidified his power, uh, or once the the king steps down or abdicates, uh, that will be when war occurs between uh, Saudi Arabia and at least Hezbollah and Lebanon, um, possibly dragging in Iran. So do you think, uh, I mean, let's st start off with North Korea. Do you think the United States is just going to go into North Korea, or do you think there is going to be some type of an event or you know false flag or something like that to bring us into North Korea? I think there would have to be a false flag or some some kind of uh, event that could be blamed on North Korea in order to allow for because North Korea even even the Department of Defense has openly admitted that there's no way to take North Korea uh, through aerial bombardment or uh, you know tomahawks or any any kind of uh, uh, aerial situation, they have to send in ground troops. The, the DoD has openly admitted this. It's what I've been saying for quite some time that a ground invasion it, uh, would have to be initiated in order to uh, uh, lock down North Korea's nukes. Uh, not lock down their artillery, which is mostly uh, based in bunkers underground. Um, there's no way to deal with that without ground troops. So uh, they would need a false flag of some kind in order to rally the public around the that idea, because it would simply be it would just be another, uh, you know, <laughs> it would be another uh, Korean War situation, which didn't turn out too well for us last time. And, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, a lot like Vietnam as well, uh, you're talking about at least a decade of, of ground presence, if not more, uh, billions, if not trillions of dollars spent, uh, it would bankrupt the United States, uh, such a war. So they, they need some kind of event in order to get the public to, to back this or to, to get them angry enough to, to not think about the consequences. Now, is China and Russia, are they, I mean, they're right on the border there. They're just going to sit by why this happens? China has actually stated, and I, I, um, I wrote an article about this a while back. It's time I've ever seen China make this statement, which was that they would, uh, they, they said they would not support regime change in North Korea unless... <laughs> they and I've never seen Chinese use this word unless uh, North Korea makes an attack first. So China has basically said that they will step back if North Korea attacks first. Uh, 
this brings to me brings to mind a perfect stage or perfect setup for a false flag event and then the chinese can step away and say well uh they attacked first so this doesn't involve us so as far as the chinese go they've already set the stage for uh a regime change as long as north korea attacks or is blamed for an attack now what about russia uh, is putin gonna you know step in or is he gonna just let it all go what do you think they're gonna do i think russia and china may act not necessarily militarily uh it will be after the fact it will be uh later after north korea turns into the mess that it will inevitably become um, but I think they will step in and it will be economically. So, again, this sort of uh, plays into the dynamic of uh, diminishing the U.S. Uh, through various means, either dumping the petrodollar, dumping the dollar's world reserve currency, uh, you know, reducing uh, export or, uh, import and export dependence on the U.S., that sort of thing. Um, I think that they will act economically, not necessarily militarily. Now, out in um, Iran, we see, you know, Israel, uh, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, you know, beating the war drums to go after Iran, like we've been talking about. And Saudi Arabia is already busy in Yemen, you know, using paid mercenaries and some of their forces there. I mean, do they have the ability to, to do something with Iran? Because personally, I don't think Iran's going to do anything because they haven't started a war in over 200 years. And what would be the reason for them to start a war? What What do you think is going to happen out with Iran and Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Israel, the United States? What do you think is going to happen in that area? Well, I think the key to this, and and I think what the glo the the tool that the globalists will exploit in order to draw Iran into a war would be their mutual defense pacts with uh, Hezbollah in in Lebanon and their mutual defense pact with uh, Assad in Syria. Uh, so if the Saudis and as we've seen in recent news, uh, their, uh, their agreements and ties to Israel, which were uh, <laughs> unreported for quite some time and, and actually straight up denied uh, there. It's now coming out that those are, yes, we do have ties with Israel and uh, they're not just uh, diplomatic or economic. They are military. So uh, I think with that tie between Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, the Saudis will feel a little more confident in acting in a in a uh, kinetic way <laughs> to attack Hezbollah in Lebanon and possibly uh, move into Syria or Israel may move into Syria and the Saudis may support so uh, at that point if we have an invasion of Syria invasion of Lebanon I do believe that the Iranians will be forced to act because uh, as far as border integrity is concerned, um, as far as uh, geostrategic uh, concerns go, um, they lose massive amounts of influence. They also become surrounded by enemies. Uh, they would be forced to act. Now, that would probably be in self-defense at, at that point. But it won't be painted that way to us. I'm sure. I'm sure it will. There will be something to occur that is, you know, they paint Iran as a an aggressor. Now the problem with Syria is that Russia is still there. I mean, they have the S three hundred, the S four hundreds, all set up there. Russia's in there, and after fighting the Islamic State, I, I, to me, in my mind, they're just not going to let another country invade Syria. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense at this point. It's possible, but uh, you have to remember the Russian ties to the re the new and improved Russian ties to Saudi Arabia, uh, the uh, um, globalist influence over Putin, IMF's influence over Russia itself. Um, so, if it, just because something doesn't necessarily work uh, in their favor to to our mind. 
uh, it may still work in favor for the globalists. And rash- rationalizing it sort of comes way after the fact, after the you know the dust settles and the fog of war is settled. And I don't think the the public will uh, question. During the event, I don't think the public will question as much, why is Russia doing this? Uh, I think they'll just see crisis and chaos. So is there a a timeline on this? I mean, we know we we mentioned the Economist magazine 2018. So do you think that all this is going to go down in the year of 2018? I think it will begin in 2018. The next phase will begin in 2018. As far as, you know, there's different... Uh, there's a uh, multiple visions and uh, policies for I'm seeing a lot of visions and policies for 2030. So it seems to me that they plan to initiate this next phase or the basically the global reset uh, around 2018 and that the plan is for this to take approximately 10 to 12 years going into 2030 where they have all these new visions of uh, a, a new world and a new system in, uh, in place. So uh, 2018, between 2018 to 2030 is, I think, when we'll see the worst of the worst. Brandon? 